It's taken me a while to get this episode done. You might even say I've been off the grid. Eh. Hello and welcome to episode 14 of HTM School, where we'll talk about one of the most exciting and intriguing discoveries in modern neuroscience, grid cells. In 2014, the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was awarded to Drs. John O'Keefe, May Britt Moser, and Edward Moser for their work discovering cells that deal with location in the brain. This included cells called grid cells, which are pyramidal neurons that create cognitive maps of space. In this experiment by Dr. May Britt and Edward Moser, a mouse has an apparatus that's monitoring one particular neuron in its entorhinal cortex, suspected to be involved with location. Every time the neuron fires an action potential, a dot is rendered to the screen in this video. At first look, it looks like the neuron's just firing randomly, but as the mouse explores the room, you can see a grid-like firing field appear across the 2D space. This shows that that one neuron, called a grid cell, responds when the mouse is in particular places in the room, and those places are spaced out in a hexagonal lattice. But why hexagons? I asked myself the same question, and that answer comes from circles. If you pack circles as close together as possible, their centers naturally create a hexagonal pattern. I'm not saying the key to intelligence in the brain is hexagons, but it's hexagons. Scientists have discovered several types of cells in the brain related to location, which include place cells in the hippocampus and head direction cells in the dorsal presubiculum. Grid cells have been found in the entorhinal cortex in rats, but there is also ample evidence of them in the neocortex of humans. For a great summary of these and other types of location cells in the brain, read the paper, The Representation of Space in the Brain. Let's take a closer look at the functionality of grid cells and some visualizations that show how grid cells can project onto space. Okay, so let's first look at a visualization of just one grid cell. So in this visualization, I've got my little mouse cursor <laughs> and I'm moving through a 2D space. As I move through the space, just like in the video from this, the experiment that we saw, sometimes a cell fires. So this is just one grid cell. Sometimes it fires as this mouse moves through this space. You can see it looks sort of random. In the bottom left corner here, I've got a representation of that grid cell. I'm going to show you all the places in the space that this cell fires as I hover over it. Here's this grid cell's firing field. It will fire when the mouse gets close to any one of these locations in this two-dimensional space. And as you can see, there are a lot of locations where it doesn't fire at all. The mouse just runs through and it never fires. So there's a couple problems with just having this one grid cell. One is that it's not always firing. And the other is that when it does fire, the grid cell isn't really telling you exactly where the mouse is because when the mouse is in one of these locations, the grid cell fires. That means it could be in any one of these locations. So it's an ambiguous representation of space. So we don't really know where the mouse is. We just know it's in one of those locations, but not which one. So in order for grid cells to be useful, we have to have more than one of them at a time. So I'm going to show you what we refer to as a grid cell module, which is a group of grid cells that all project onto a space in the same way. So take a look at this. I've got this grid cell module that has 16 cells in it that sort of have this parallelogram shape and tile across this whole two-dimensional shape. So the grid cells themselves are not arranged in any way in the brain. They are tiled across a two-dimensional space in this example. So it's not like the grid cells are right by each other and they're retaining this shape. This is just how they represent space, this tiling, this parallelogram. So as I walk through this space with the mouse, again, you can see there's always a grid cell in this module firing. So we're past the problem of not being able to represent some of the space. But again, it's still ambiguous because this 
cell 12, for example, still has a firing field that is, could represent a lot of different places in the space. Let me turn all of these firing fields on and you can sort of see, here is cell six firing field as I move across the space. Cell three is now firing because it's being stimulated, but we still don't know which one of these dots in the space is the mouse in. It could be any one of these. We know because I put a mouse over top of it, but this grid cell module doesn't know where that mouse is. It just knows it's one of these dots moving through the space. So before we move on to tell you how you can get a unique representation, let me show you a couple characteristics of grid cell modules. For example, you can change a grid cell module's orientation, and this becomes really important when we talk about using multiple grid cell modules to represent space. So I can move the orientation however I like. It doesn't change the functionality of what the grid cells are doing or how the modules are interacting with each other. I can also change the scale. I could have a very um, a big projection or a small projection. Uh, it's still, it doesn't change the functionality. You might also change the sensitivity of the grid cells. So here is, here is a, a, an example where two grid cells, the closest two locations to uh, that the mouse right now are going to be firing. Um, but what I really want to show you is many grid cell modules working together to represent a space. So here's an example again of just one grid cell module and I've made it pretty small so you can see this example. Um, as the mouse moves we, we don't know exactly where it is we just know it's in one of these dots and it's moving through space. Now if I add another grid cell module to the mix, we're going to get, and I'm going to change its orientation so it's vastly different. Okay, so that, that, that makes, a, makes a difference. I'm going to turn off the lines too. Um, so now I've got two grid cell modules that are kind of interplaying together here. So let's take this example where the mouse is like right around here. I'm going to freeze the screen and, and we're going to draw a little bit over here. So here's where the mouse is. And these two grid cell modules both have, uh, are both responding to this location right here very, very well because it's almost a complete overlap right there. Um, but back where we, uh, there might have been ambiguity before, um, there's no confusion. Where there is confusion um, is, say, this is where the mouse is. There's another area right here where there's overlap. There's a little overlap here, a little overlap here. So these firing fields are overlapping, and here's a lot of overlap right there. Um, the firing fields are overlapping, and while there's not like a complete ambiguity, it's not like every dot in the hexagonal lattice could be where the mouse is. Now we have many fewer places where the mouse might be because we're coordinating one grid cell module's representation of the space with another's representation of the space, and they're both projecting onto the space in slightly different ways. One has a different orientation. It looks like it's a little bit larger. Um, and you can see as we move and add another grid cell module, that um, ambiguity gets less and less because as you add more modules, let's go ahead and add all five grid cell modules here. Um, and now you can see, so I'm going to freeze this again right here where the mouse is and, and show you, okay, here's all of those grid cell modules have a, a firing field that's that's overlapping with every other grid cell module right here. So they all th think that's th the mouse could be here. This is the only place in the whole two-dimensional space that they all think the mouse might be. Now, there may be some spots where there's some random collisions, like you know, o over, over here, they're, they're getting kind of close, and maybe over here, you know, there's three out of five are, are overlapped. But it doesn't look like there's any other location in this, this particular 2D space where there's any ambiguity. This is the only place right here in the middle where the mouse actually was where all of the modules agreed and had overlap. Uh, so if we add more modules, we will get better resolution on our locations and we can represent more unique spaces in this way. Now, I also want to talk about another projection onto one dimensional space. Um, so I just showed you two dimensions, but I want to show one dimension so that we can talk about three dimensions in a moment. I'm doing the exact same thing here that I was doing in two dimensions 
but with just one dimension here. As you can see, I've got several grid cell modules with a little bit different scalings. Um, we don't have to worry about orientation in this case, so they're just a little bit different scalings. They all have five grid cells in them. And in this case, they're only projecting across one dimension, let's say a one dimensional line. Um, but it works the same way. Using them all together, if I have a, a mouse running across this line, these grid cell modules can all work together to give me uh, a very um, obvious representation that the mouse is here. You can, there's really no other place in here that the, that the mouse might be, which is uh, great. Um, so this works in two dimensions as well as one dimension, and you could uh, potentially imagine building a three-dimensional representation by simply taking the grid cell modules that project onto a 2D space and adding another set of grid cell modules that are projecting onto a 1D space um, so that you can capture all three dimensions and have a representation of that. So another thing I like to show, and, and so you're going to see some, this is kind of a fun little wallpaper here, um, if you will. So what I've done here is I've taken a bunch of different grid cell modules, I think there's 10 of them here, and I've scaled them all differently and oriented them differently, and I've turned on more than one cell in each grid cell module. And, and the thing I like to show here is look at this SDR in, in the top left. This is just the concatenation of every one of those grid cell modules, all of their on bits and off bits. And it gives us a unique representation of this 2D space as we move the mouse around. And that's, in essence, what grid cell modules are, is they're little SDRs. You combine them all together, and you have a big SDR that represents unique locations in space that can map high dimensional space just using these grid cell modules. If we move this mouse to another room, its grid cell modules would project onto that space in the same way. In new environments, the firing of different grid cells remains coordinated, such that the grid patterns of grid cells rotate and move together, maintaining a stable relationship. Another interesting thing is that when you turn off the lights on the mouse in the room, its grid cells continue to fire normally as it moves around in complete darkness. This suggests that grid cells may be involved in computations related to path integration. Every grid cell plays a role in SDRs that represent different spaces. Grid cell modules are combined into larger populations of cells that represent many unique spaces. We believe grid cells are not only used to create cognitive maps of physical space, but are also used to create conceptual maps of ideas in your brain. There is actually experimental evidence of this in some current neuroscience papers in the video description below. But think about what it takes for you to learn a new concept, especially one that is said to have a lot of moving parts. You are said to explore the ideas and visualize how they work together. Even the words I've just used, like moving parts, have a spatial component. Some concepts feel similar to other concepts, even though they describe different phenomena. Think about what you're going to be doing later today. It's right around the corner, isn't it? What about tomorrow? That's further away from you. Next week? Next month? What do you see yourself doing next year? Is it too distant to visualize? Too fuzzy to nail down? You see my point here? Think about sound for a moment and the terms you use to describe it. Low versus high pitches, smooth or rough tones, distortion, etc. How are you feeling right now? When you're confident, you feel big, puffed up, and full, as opposed to small and empty. If you're indecisive, you may be limp or flaccid. If you're too busy, you might describe yourself as stretched too thin. These are all descriptions of space. We humans have a tendency to try and describe non-spatial things in spatial terms, because that's how we experience reality. It makes sense that grid cells might play an extremely important role in representing everything in your brain, not just places that you've been. I'll expand on these ideas in future episodes. I hope this leaves you with a lot to think about and a fascination for how things are really working in your brain. Be sure to check out the show notes below for links to all the papers and talks I mentioned. And thanks for watching HDM School.
I'm not saying the key to intelligence is hexagons, but it's hexagons. I'm not saying the key to intelligence in the brain is hexagons, but it's hexagons. I'm not, I'm not saying, saying the key to intelligence in the brain is hexagons, hexagons but, it's, but it's hexagons. I'm not saying the key to intelligence in the brain is hexagons, but it's hexagons. One of those has to work. <laughs> okay.